any questions on the hypergeometric functions and we introduce the integral representations. Um, as I said, the integral representations are very convenient. I mean, you know, you can obtain the relations between various, I mean, there are only two independent uh, solutions to that equation, but you can, you can expand around z equal to 0, around z equal to 1, and z equal to infinity, and how you relate these different expansions, right? That is much more easy to see it from, the, from this uh, integral representation. Uh, is there any question on the integral representation? I mean, there are a lot of things to say about it, um, but I, I obviously I don't have any time because today and uh, Friday is the last day. So I will try to, you know, uh, because I will have to omit a lot of things from here. I mean, if, but perhaps you should try to read, you know, during the break, Christmas break, uh, all these various properties they give. The various relations between different hypergeometric functions, etc. Try to read it. I mean, it's uh, you can prove them. Step. I mean, all the proofs are given, but I just don't have time to go through that. Huh? Uh, to to give you an example, there is one of the relations is what happens. Uh, again, this is. Uh, I mean, I will not prove it, but um, it's more or less. Um, you know, uh, you have this relation. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you take, uh, so the f satisfies the equation z times 1 minus z d2 uh, u by dz2 plus, uh, uh, plus uh, c minus a plus minus a b u equal to 0. And f a b c z is the solution which is analytic. At z, near z equal to zero, yes. is analytic near z equal to zero. So this was the definition of FABC, and it's also normalized so that at z equal to zero, it's one. Huh? You normalize it like that. Okay. Now what you can ask: What happens if you take df by dz? Right. Well, this is also going to be analytic near z equal to zero, right? Because the derivative of an analytic function is again analytic near. Uh, so this is near z equal to 0. But uh, what, what you can do is that just take a derivative of, to obtain this. What, what, what you can express this again in terms of hypergeometric function, OK, this quantity. And OK, let me just uh, show this. So suppose I start from this and take it. So remember, this is f, huh? f with these arguments. I will I have not this satisfy this equation, right? Where f, f is this, this f. Uh, now let's take a derivative of this entire equation. So you'll get one term will be simply z, 1 minus z, uh, d3f uh, over dz2, which I can write it as d2. So let me call this something. Let's call it g, OK? g is equal to df by dz. Then this is d2g over dz2, right? Because three derivatives are the same as uh, two derivatives on this, right? Uh, then you'll get a term which will be a derivative hitting here. So that will give you. Um, so minus, what is it, uh, 1 minus 2z, right? When the d by dz acts here. Because after all, this is z minus z squared. So derivative of that is that. And uh, d2f by d2f uh, by, so which is the same as dg by dz. Right? I want to write everything in terms of g. Um, then uh, here, uh, so then from here I will get uh, again, uh, two terms. When the derivative hits here, I'll just get dg by dz again. So it's uh, c minus a plus b plus 1 uh, uh, z times, uh, times dg by dz. So that is when the derivative hits here. But when the derivative hits here, I will just get uh, nothing. It will be just g. So you get here plus or uh, minus a plus b plus 1. Uh, derivative hits there, so that's just this one, times g, because df by dz is g. Hmm? And then finally here, you just get minus ab times df by dz, which is again g. So minus a, b, g, right? a, b are constant, so derivative doesn't hit here. So that's equal to 0. And now we can again uh, put, you see, it's again of the hypergeometric form, because look at the coefficient of dg by dz is again a linear function of z, right? 
and the coefficient of g is like constant again, just like here. Right? So it's again hypergeometric equation. But now if you combine all the things, uh, the coefficient of dg by dz here is, uh, let's see, uh, the constant term is c plus 1, right? This is c plus 1. And, uh, and the, the linear term in z is uh, a plus b. So uh, let me write it like this, a plus 1 plus b plus 1 plus 1. Because you see, you have, you have a plus b plus 1 plus 2, because there's a minus here. I take it, so this is minus. I take out a minus. Huh? So it's a plus b plus 1 plus 2, which is a plus b plus 3, which I write it in like this, in a suggestive way. Huh? And look at the coefficient of g. So that is minus. There's minus in both. You get here g times, you see what is it? a b plus a plus b plus 1, which is a plus 1 times b plus 1. You see? So it's the same hypergeometric equation, except that a, b, and c have been replaced by a plus 1, b plus 1, and c plus 1. Right? So the conclusion from this is that uh, the df by dz, which is g, is proportional. So f, a, b, c, z is proportional to f, a plus 1, b plus 1, c plus 1, z. You see, um, why can I say that? I mean, all I know is that G satisfies a differential equation with A, B, C replaced by A plus 1, B plus 1, C plus 1, right? Now, this differential equation will have two solutions. Say near Z equal to 0 when I expand, it will have two solutions. But the one which is analytic is this one, right? The one which is not analytic is the other one, the second solution, okay? So the one which is analytic is this one. So, I mean, it, a priori you would have said that G is some linear combination of the analytic solution plus the other one, right, which is non-analytic. However, I know that df by dz is analytic. So, it, so the g must be, I mean, this g must be the analytic one, not the other solution, not a, no combination with the other solution is involved there. Hmm? Because if we combine with the second solution, it will be non-analytic, okay, near z equal to 0. So, you conclude that. And now, how you compute the constant, well, just look at the z, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so you want so this is equal to some constant say k times this you can determine this k by just studying at what happens at z equal to 0 right so this one remember the expansion of this was f a b c z uh, was um, gamma a plus n gamma b plus n over gamma 1 plus n gamma c plus n and then you just normalize it to make it 1, uh, gamma uh, C over gamma A, gamma B, right? This is expansion, Z to the N. Now, I take a derivative. So, and then after taking derivative, I want to put Z equal to 0, right? So, the only term which is relevant is Z to the 1. Higher powers of Z will disappear, right? When I take derivative and then set Z equal to 0. So all I need to look at is what, what is the coefficient of z to the 1 term here. So this, this expression is, okay, first 0th term is, 0th power is 1. I mean, that's how I normalized it. Then you get here gamma a plus 1, uh, so n equal to 1, a plus 1, which is uh, simply a, I mean, gamma a plus 1 divided by gamma a is a. So it's a, similarly, gamma b plus 1 divided by gamma b is b, b and this divided by that is c, okay? And then you have gamma 1 plus uh, gamma 2, which is again 1. Hmm? So this times z. Okay. So df by dz and then set z equal to 0 is simply a, b divided by c. So just evaluate both sides at z equal to 0. So this is simply a, b divided by c. Okay. And uh, so uh, whereas on the other hand, this hypergeometric function always is normalized to 1 at z equal to 0. So that tells me that k must be equal to a b divided by c. Hmm? So this k is simply a b divided by c. And this is then the, this is the equation. I mean, this you get. The derivative of f is again some constant times f with the argument shifted by 1, a b c shifted by 1. Hmm? Now suppose I look at now, you keep, now, now you can keep doing it, right? You can keep applying more and more derivatives. So if I apply d uh, n f, by dzn, a, b, c, z, what's going to happen? You see, at each time I take a derivative, this increases by 1, right? 
So when I do n times, it will increase by n steps. So this will become f a plus n, b plus n, c plus n, z. And what about this constant? I mean, so next time when I make, take a derivative, then this constant will be a plus 1 times b plus 1 divided by c plus 1, right? The next time it will be a plus 2, b plus 2 divided by c plus 2, right? So this is going to become the product a up to a plus n minus 1, right? Which is actually gamma of a plus n divided by gamma a, okay? And similarly, gamma of b plus n divided by gamma b. And here it will become gamma c divided by gamma c plus n. So n derivative of f is simply, again, this constant times f shifted, where arguments are shifted by n units. So you can find all sorts of relations. I mean, uh, many relations you can obtain by starting from this integral equation. By the way, that integral representation is called the Euler formula. Okay, this is called Euler. For, Euler must have been the first one who did that. Huh? So, okay, it's so Euler formula. And using that formula and making various changes of variables, uh, you can get again lots of identities. Right? But I mean, I will not go into all that. It's all in the, many of the identities are given here, but not all. If you want to study, get all the identities, you must look at some, you know, this mathematical, you know, handbooks and so on, which have huge numbers of identities for all these functions are given. Hmm? But you should be able to derive all of them by using these techniques, which are given here. Um, yeah, so um, uh, then, then there are some special cases of the hypergeometric functions where, I mean, hypergeometric functions, we, you know, that's the infinite series, right? When I go uh, expand around z equal to 0, there's an infinite series. But it's for some special cases, that infinite series collapses to a finite series, finite. It becomes a finite polynomial. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, just to take some of the examples, uh, again, let's look at, uh, so for example, so remember what is the, 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 let's again write down the series solution, A, B, C, Z. This is gamma A, gamma B, divided by gamma C. Sorry, other way around, right? Gamma C, gamma A, gamma B, gamma A plus N, gamma B plus N. And Z to the N. And this goes from N equal to 0 to infinity. Now, in some special cases, it might happen that uh, this uh, series uh, collapses to um, finite number of polynomials, finite number of things. Uh, for example, let's say, suppose I, uh, let's uh, take, say, I take B equal to C, okay? In which case, just to simplify, it's not necessary. If B equal to C, this cancels with that, right? Similarly, this cancels with that. And in that case, the series simply becomes uh, 1 over gamma A, uh, N equal to 0 to infinity, and you have gamma A plus N divided by gamma 1 plus N Z to the N, right? Even B is equal to C. But furthermore, now you see, I can further uh, take a situation. Suppose A was a negative integer. Suppose A was equal to minus M, okay? where M is some positive integer. Okay? So then what's going to happen? This is gamma of a negative integer. So this, will, this is infinite, right? So actually, it's so 1 over infinity. So the whole thing is 0 unless, unless this also becomes infinite, you see? So when can that become infinite? So a, a is minus m. So this is my, gamma of this is gamma of n minus m, right? At the top, here is gamma n plus one. Uh, so whenever n is less than m, less than or equal to m, this is also a negative integer, right? So in those cases, I mean, this also this is infinite. That's infinite, right? So you get a finite quantity, right? You can, I mean, yeah. You can get a finite quantity. However, the, the moment n is greater than m, this is positive. So this is finite. Whereas here it's 1 divided by infinity. So it is 0, right? So, so therefore, this truncates, this series truncates, this goes only up to m, right? So in fact, we can write down like this. So gamma a. And you can, 
so, I mean, the one way to do this is using that, um, I mean, don't, don't take, let's, I mean, don't put, um, so keep it A, because I have to not take the limit. I have to take the limit, you see, A goes to minus M. I mean, A, A, A equal to minus M, it's not very well defined, right? You have to take the limit, A goes to minus M. And for this, you can use this, um, this famous thing, I mean, this, one of the equations that we wrote down, gamma of A, gamma of, uh, remember, Z, uh, uh, x or something, let's call it x, gamma of 1 minus x is equal to pi divided by sine pi x, right? This was one of the conditions or equations we derived for the gamma functions. So using this, I mean, what is the use of this? You see, it, it, the use is that if one of them is negative, the other guy is positive, right? The, one of the arguments, say this argument is supposed negative, then this argument is positive and vice versa, right? I mean, okay, let's say negative, let's say minus two. For example, suppose this is minus two, then, I mean, not always. If, if x is between zero and one, both are positive. But say, take x negative. If x is negative, this is positive, right? Uh, so, uh, now that's what I want to do. I want to convert this negative guy. I mean, A finally is going to become minus M, right? So, A is something negative. I, I want to convert this to a positive guy, so I can use this. So, this is the same as, uh, this is the same as, gamma of 1 minus a, uh, you see, I mean, I, I take down here, and then I have to, so this 1 over gamma a, right? So this becomes sine pi a uh, divided by pi, okay? I mean, this, this factor. Same way, this factor becomes uh, 1 over uh, gamma of 1 minus n plus a, okay? Uh, and then you get here sine pi um, n plus a, okay, pi. And then there is a 1 over gamma n. That is, that is no problem. That is always, that is, um, there is no problem with the gamma n. I leave it as it is. And now I can start taking the limit. Because first of all, you see this guy, these two cancel, right? Uh, these two sine, because the sine pi of n plus a is the same as, I think, minus 1 to the n times sine pi a, right? Minus one to the n. Huh? I mean, minus one to the n. So, so this is the same as sine pi a times uh, minus one to the n, right? Okay. Now sine pi a, sine pi a cancels. Pi pi cancels. And now you see, I can take the limit. Uh, a goes to minus m. If a goes to minus m, this becomes gamma one plus m, right? Now you take the limit. A goes to m uh, minus m. So this becomes gamma of uh, 1 plus m. And uh, here it becomes um, 1 minus gamma of m plus 1 minus n, right? A is minus m, so that adds up. And then you have 1 over gamma n plus 1 times minus 1 to the n, you see. So now there is no problem. I can take the limit. I mean, because each, each of them is finite. So this is the right way of doing it. Instead, instead of I mean, blindly doing, I mean, if you just do it, it doesn't make much sense. No, you have to take the limit. Approach a equal to minus m. No? Uh, so, but doing so is better to convert it into positive arguments here by using this identity. Okay. The crucial point is that this cancels. See, that's the point. I mean, this is what was giving you divergence. You see, if you look at this expression, what was giving you, what was telling you that when x is negative integer, this is divergent. It was this factor. This fa this is the all the divergence is captured here, hmm? and the important point is these divergences cancel when you write it like that. Huh? Okay, uh, but now you can immediately see what is this. I mean, this uh, expression. So so what we have is this n equal to zero up to m. You see, because you can Im immediately see when n is greater than m, this becomes either zero or negative. Right? Say when n is equal to m plus 1 or m plus 2 and so on and so forth, this becomes the argument of gamma, this gamma function becomes 0 or negative integers. Right? But that means this is infinite. Right? So all these coefficients are 0 then. Right? That's why it truncates up to m. This, uh, right? Because the rest of the coefficients are 0. Okay? And uh, so this is, uh, but this, uh, we know what it is, right? I mean, what is this? Uh, uh, this is factorial m, right? That is uh, factorial m minus n. 
this is factorial n and then you have minus 1 to the uh, time z to the n minus 1 to the n z to the n m, uh, m equal uh, m equal to 0 n equal to 0 to n this is just the uh, this is just m c n this coefficient is m c n minus 1 to the n z to the n okay so this is uh, 1 plus z to the power of m uh, 1 minus z to the m yeah it's a uh, so very simple. so uh, this in this particular case this hypergeometric function when b is equal to c and a is equal to minus m this entire thing is simply 1 minus z to the m So things like that. I mean, you, you, you know, there are this. Uh, yeah. I mean, m more more generally. I mean, if you don't take. I mean, if you don't take a equal to minus m, uh, already from this expression, you see that this is nothing else but. Um, um, let me see. Uh, one. This is uh, one minus z to the power of minus a. You remember when we, we when we I think a uh, few days back yes last time I tried to uh, expand the, the, the expansion of this guy right this was exactly this gamma of a plus n divided by gamma if you remember it was this this expansion I mean you just take uh, n derivatives of this these guys I mean n derivatives of these guys and you know when you make a Taylor expansion at z equal to zero huh? you make a Taylor expansion and you find these are the coefficients. You just take n derivatives. I mean, what is the coefficient of that? Is one over factorial n times n derivative of this function evaluated at z equal to zero? And when you take n derivatives, you see you get a times a plus one times a plus two, right? All the way up to a plus n minus one, and that is this factor gamma of a plus n divided by gamma a. So this more generally is that, and but for a equal to minus m, it is simply becomes one minus z to the m. But I mean, one has to be a little careful when you, I mean, I, what I'm saying is that the correct way to do this when you take the limit a equal to minus m is to, you know, go through this anal procedure. Huh? Okay. All right. So then there are, okay, many, many relations, but I, I'm not going to go through that. Ah, now let me say the following thing. In the first, uh, I mean, the third chapter, you remember we studied these classical polynomials, right? We had Hermit, Laguerre, uh, and Jacobi polynomials. These are three basic classes. Then uh, special cases of Jacobi polynomials were Le Legendre polynomial and so on. But Jacobi po polynomial is sufficiently general. Huh? Many of the interesting cases are inside the Jacobi polynomial. So it turns out Jacobi polynomial is just a particular case of hypergeometric function. Okay. Uh, so to, to show this, can I, I can erase this all this. So to, to see this, uh, now I don't have the, I mean, I don't know if you have the third chapter with you, but uh, you remember we had uh, uh, this Jacobi polynomials, uh, which comes with uh, two parameters, right? I think we were calling it new, mu and new. Now in this chapter, somehow for some reason, they call it alpha and beta, but it is the same thing. Hmm? So, so it was, uh, the equation was, so we had P alpha, I mean, sort of new mu, I'm calling alpha beta here, just to keep this notation here. Um, so uh, it, it was, uh, uh, and I think there was an n. So this satisfied the differential equation, 1 minus z square, uh, d2 u by dz2, uh, u being this p, uh, plus beta minus alpha minus alpha plus beta plus 2 times z, uh, du by dz, and then plus uh, n times n plus alpha plus beta plus one. Okay, this was the this this was the equation that this p was satisfying. Huh? Um, now, of course, we can. I mean, here this was n was an integer, right? But we can generalize it. 
we can just put an arbitrary number, arbitrary number lambda. Okay. Uh, so, but this is ex uh, this is like a hypergeometric equation after all, right? Instead of z times one minus z, here is one minus z square. So, if you look at the singularities, because when you, you have to divide this, right, by one minus z square, the singularities at z equal to plus one and minus one, and of course, z equal to infinity will be there. Right? So, here in this thing, the singularities are at z equal to minus one, plus one, and infinity. Whereas in the hypergeometric case, that the standard hypergeometric equation that we wrote down, we chose the singularities at 0, 1, and infinity, right? But that's very easy to uh, uh, do. I mean, you just want to map these three points to these three points, right? And that is uh, sim simply done by taking z uh, goes to, um, let's see, one, uh, maybe, uh, for example, 1 minus z by 2. 1 minus z by 2, uh, if uh, when z is equal to plus 1, uh, this becomes 0. When z equal to minus 1, this becomes 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So actually, uh, by this map, you're taking this guy here, this guy there, and infinity goes to minus infinity, but it doesn't matter. Infinity and minus infinity are the same. All the points at infinity are the same, right? So, so this is this map. If you do this map, uh, then... Uh, so let's say z equal to um, um, is that correct? Yeah, z equal to one minus z prime by two. No, other way around. So z prime equal to one minus z by two. Yeah. So let, let's do this. Uh, so then uh, this this expression. Um, I think we have to just rewrite it. So write. Uh, so if I invert it, so it becomes two z prime equal to one minus z which implies z equal to um, 1 minus 2 z prime, right? Is that correct? z prime equal to 0, this is 1, z prime equal to 1, this is minus 1, that's correct. Right? Uh, so if I substitute this, um, actually, why do I, why am I doing this? It's 1 minus z times 1 plus z after all, this object, right? So 1 minus z is 2 z prime. And what is 1 plus z? 1 plus z is 1, uh, uh, sorry, 2 minus 1 minus z, right? Uh, so that is 2z prime. So it's 2 times 1 minus z prime, as expected. It should become z prime times 1 minus z prime eventually, right? The two singular points in the z prime coordinate. And the d by dz uh, will become minus 2 by, minus 2 by, uh, so what is d, dz prime, d, d by dz? That's equal to, from here, um, is the same as minus 1 half d by dz prime, right? Yeah. So you do this, so this four, fac four factor of four cancels, and you just get uh, d2 by dz prime square, OK? Uh, and then here, you'll get plus beta minus alpha. And then you get here minus alpha plus beta plus 2 times z, which is 1 minus 2z prime. And then du by dz, uh, that gives you minus half. So this is becomes minus half uh, d by dz prime u. And then the last one remains as it is, plus lambda times. So it's again of the hypergeometric form, right? Because this is, after all, a linear function of z prime. And that is a constant. So we can now read out from there. And we just have to just have to just keep this uh, z, uh, z prime equal to 1 minus z by 2. Okay. So, so by just by re rearranging this, uh, you get. Um, Let's see, the constant coefficient now becomes, I mean, well, it's a little bit of work here. Uh, so beta, beta cancels. You get a minus 2 alpha with a 1, the 1. Huh? Minus 2 alpha plus 2. And the 2 cancels, so you get here, so I write it as uh, plus uh, alpha, uh, 2, uh, plus 1 minus alpha, right? Uh, plus alpha minus 1, sorry. Plus alpha minus 1. 
Is that, I mean, am I making a mistake? I mean, it, this beta, beta cancels. If I, I'm taking this one here. Beta, beta cancels. Alpha adds up, so minus two alpha, and there is a plus two, uh, minus two, sorry, it's plus one, sorry. Plus one. Okay? And then the z prime part, uh, that comes with a minus, 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 so altogether minus. These two cancels. So you get here minus alpha plus beta plus two z prime du by dz prime. That is this term. And here is z prime 1 minus z prime d2 u by dz prime square. And then finally that. Uh, plus, yeah, lambda should be negative. So, so I, I should. Uh, so this becomes plus. So I can write it as minus, minus lambda, times alpha plus beta plus uh, lambda plus one. Right? I just put a minus minus to bring it into minus because it was minus a times b. Yeah, that form. Um, so let's see if this works. So this should become the C, right? This is C. And uh, let's say one of them I call A, other I call B. And uh, here, this is supposed to be A plus B plus 1, right? Is it correct? A plus B plus 1. So this is A plus B plus 1. So the solution then is just F, uh, A, A, B, C. So it's minus lambda, alpha plus beta plus lambda plus 1. Uh, C is alpha plus 1, and uh, Z, Z prime, but Z prime is 1 minus Z by 2. Right? So the claim, so therefore this is simply P alpha beta, alpha beta lambda is equal to that. I mean, this is one of the solution. So this is solution is a solution which is analytic at z prime equal to zero, which means with analytic at uh, z near z equal to one. Hmm? This, this uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, now again, I think uh, you should be able to show. Uh, okay, I will not that uh, this series. I mean, if you just by using the sum formula for this series, because after all, you, you know that when lambda is equal to n, this is a finite polynomial. Uh, so it should happen again, that like what I discussed before. For lambda equal to n, positive n, uh, uh, this should again, this infinite series should truncate, to, for the same reason that I discussed before. But I will not repeat now again the same thing. Uh, it should again truncate. So, yeah, you just write down this power series. You know, it's a, it's a one over gamma uh, minus lambda gamma a uh, gamma a gamma alpha plus beta plus lambda plus one and gamma alpha plus 1 times the sum, gamma n plus, I mean the, the, that same sum, gamma alpha plus 1 plus n, and gamma 1 plus n, z to the n. And something sh should happen when lambda equal to uh, positive integer, the, because this is in infinite, so this sum will truncate for the same reason before. Yeah? So this is, um, yeah. Of, of course, given this differential equation, there is another solution also, right? I mean, this was the analytic solution, right? But there's another solution which, uh, remember, it was it went like z to the power of 1 minus c. Uh, so z being z prime, z prime to the 1 minus c times another hypergeometric function, right? That will be another solution, OK? Uh, that solution. Uh, so that solution, again, will be a solution of this equation. But it will not be a polynomial like that. It will have singularity, right? Because it goes like z prime to the 1 minus c. So it will have a singularity near z equal to 1. So that's the two solutions. OK, now you can specialize to the case. I mean, uh, Legendre is nothing else. Legendre was just obtained by choosing alpha equal to beta equal to 0, right? So, so that means. For the Legendre, you just set alpha equal to beta equal to 0. Uh, so that's simply f minus lambda and uh, lambda plus 1, 1, and 1 minus z by 2. Once again, for lambda equal to positive integer, this becomes a polynomial. 
uh, finite polynomial. Otherwise, it will be uh, infinite. For arbitrary lambda, it will be infinite uh, series. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I just want this is just to show that I mean how hypergeometric functions are related to almost everything that you have seen so far. I mean, this is uh, Jacobi polynomials. Uh, but now, the other thing that I wanted to do. Uh, lambda is minus beta. So, so uh, lambda is minus beta. So that disappears. This becomes gamma of alpha plus one. This cancels. Hmm? And here, lambda equal to minus beta. So again, this cancels with that, right? So it it will not truncate unless, of course, lambda equal to the integer, right? Um, yeah. If you take lambda equal to minus beta. So then uh, all of this, this cancels with that, uh, this cancels with that. So you just have a, uh, this sum. Uh, but in that case, probably you can write it as, uh, as lambda. Uh, I mean, that formula which I wrote down, this, this is probably 1 minus z to the power of uh, maybe lambda or something like that. Huh? Yeah, lambda, exactly. Correct? Yeah. This, this, uh, this expansion in that case, lambda equal to minus beta is just that. But if lambda is a negative integer, or if not a if it's not a positive integer, there's not a finite polynomial, right? When you expand it, it's only for lambda equal to positive integer. Will be. Actually, that is what gives you. The, I mean, you see, typically what happens. I mean, in quantum mechanics and so on, you get some differential equation, right? This is like the Schrodinger equation, which you know, which will appear. Now, uh, you see, and you see that uh, uh, this will be the kind of eigenvalue, right? I mean, this will be kind of eigenvalue equation, right? Uh, these numbers, this lambda says related to eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, for example. Huh? Uh, so, uh, now if, if you choose arbitrary lambda, then this will be an infinite series, okay? And uh, that, will, that, that will start having divergences at, uh, I mean, here this is an uh, analytic function near z equal to 1. But what about z equal to 0? You have to also check z equal to 0 what happens there, right? So if you want to have in both, you, I mean, you want to have regularity in both, both points, both endpoints, z equal to minus 1 to z equal to plus 1 hmm? uh, in the original variable z. In the z prime variable, it is 0 and 1, hmm? between 0 and 1. You want regularity on both sides, and that essentially picks out uh, this, uh, the, I mean, uh, if, if the polynomial truncates to a finite polynomial, of course it is going to be analytic on both. Any finite polynomial will be an analytic at uh, any f finite value of z. I mean, we don't care about z equal to infinity because that's outside the domain. Because, uh, uh, yeah, it, I mean, Legendre, for example, appears. Why is it? Why the z between minus one and plus one? Because z is cosine theta. You know, the, you in this the three-dimensional problem, you have the ang uh, radial coordinate r, then the uh, Angular coordinates, theta and phi, right? So theta, of course, is between zero and pi, right? Phi is the azimuthal angle, and theta is between zero and pi. So cosine theta is going to be between minus one and plus one. So you don't care what happens uh, beyond that, no? You only want it to be regular in the real line between minus one and plus one, okay? Which in the z prime variable, it will be between zero and one, okay? So if it is a finite polynomial, of course, it's going to be analytic everywhere. Whereas if it is not a finite polynomial, this will develop a, a branch cut or singularity at uh, the other next point, z, z prime equal to 1, you see. As we saw before that, uh, yeah? I mean, in fact, uh, you can see from here, uh, this, uh, this expression, so what was that? Sorry, this is not z, it's 1 minus z, right? I mean, the argument is 1 minus z over 2 to the n. So this will be 1 minus 1 minus z by 2 to the power of lambda. I mean, this was z prime. So, uh, so at z prime equal to 1, the, if lambda was not an integer, there will be a, a, not a regular solution, right? There is kind of a cut, branch cut. And that is what tells you that lambda must be an integer. For the, for the physical, uh, uh, I mean, the quantum mechanics problem, you want the wave function to be well behaved, right? Then this lambda has to be integer. That's what gives you the quantization conditions. But there may be other physical problems where you don't 
you, I mean, you are not looking at these kind of issues. You are really interested in singularities and things like that. You know? So the more generally, you have to look at, I mean, this is the more general Legendre. Uh, Legendre functions, they call, you call it Legendre functions because generally they are not polynomials, right? Only for lambda equal to integer, positive integer is a polynomial. Otherwise, it's just a, it's called Legendre function. Again, there is a, another, this is one of the solutions of that equation. There will be other solution which will have the singularity uh, z, uh, z prime to the power of 1 minus c, right? 1 minus c. Okay. So uh, c, c is alpha plus 1 al and alpha is 0. Uh, so actually, it's not even singular. <laughs> but anyway, now there's another solution which is singular at z prime uh, uh, going to infinity. Not at z prime equal to 1, but z prime going to infinity. There's another solution. Goes to so you choose two linearly independent solutions like that. It's described in the notes, but I, I will now move on to confluent hypergeometric functions because that is again, that's again a very important, many functions. Here, Jacobi functions were related directly hypergeometric functions, right? Jacobi functions are the same as hypergeometric functions. Uh, but uh, if you want to ask what happens to Hermite and Laguerre polynomials, they are not directly hypergeometric functions, but they can be obtained by some limiting procedure starting from a hypergeometric function. Okay? And that limiting procedure will, be the, will give you something called confluent hypergeometric function. Right? Uh, and also a very important function which we have not never discussed so far, the Bessel function, which appears all over physics. Huh? Uh, Bessel functions are related to confluent hypergeometric functions. So for this reason, I think from the rest of the today and uh, next lecture, I will be discussing this confluent hypergeometric and Bessel functions. Of course, not in too much detail because that's really, to really discuss all the properties, you need a lot of time. And it's here we will also come across the irregular singularities. I mean, so far we have always worked with the regular singularities, right? Now, in this limiting procedure that we'll be discussing, one of the singularity will become irregular. Yeah, confluent. Okay, so now we discuss the uh, section 19. That's uh, confluent. functions. Okay. Uh, so the, let's go back to the, our original equation where we had the singularities at z1, z2, and z3. Hmm? Uh, I mean, remember, in uh, going to the hypergeometric, we set the singularities at 0, 1, and infinity. Hmm? But uh, I will keep, I will bring back the uh, things because we're going to take limits. Okay. So that's why I want to bring it back. So okay, one of the points I will take the 0, the singularities are at z equal to 0. And then I, I keep the z2 and z3. So I just put z1 equal to 0. Right? Uh, before what we did, we put one, z1 equal to 0, z3 equal to 1, and z2 equal to infinity. Right? But I want to keep these two things because what I will do is I will bring them together, z2 and z3 together, hmm? not, not separately. So let's write down the equation. The original equation, it was d2 u by dz2 plus uh, uh, plus uh, c over z. Uh, I mean, these are three parameters: one minus a minus b divided by z minus z two uh, plus one minus c minus a plus b divided by z minus z three. I mean, this was uh, the same. Uh, the, you remember that? Uh, uh, I mean, that was the starting point of the hypergeometric e equation that we obtained, right? We had the poles, first order pole at the three points. I mean, uh, just I put z, z1 equal to 0, that's all. Uh, and with the three parameters here, and the condition was that the sum of these parameters must be equal to 1, right? And let's see if it's true. C, C cancels when you add them up, minus, oh. How come? I think there's a misprint here. Must be a misprint, huh? No, the sum of them is equal to one or two. But in any case, this A had to cancel. So one of the signs is wrong here. Either here it's wrong or there it's wrong. Because some of these must be equal to one. Uh, otherwise, you will get divergence at infinity. 
infinity would not be a, a, a ordinary point. Huh? Uh, how come? I mean, this. Um, so, I mean, I mean, we have to go back to see uh, what is that. Zero. I mean, we have to go back to this equation sixteen point one. No, uh, yeah. Uh, no, sorry. It's it's written. No, not the sum. Some of that had to be two actually, right? Some of that had to be two. But in any case, I mean, this a has to cancel. So there's something wrong. Either this sign is wrong or that sign is wrong. Okay, one of them. Uh, okay. I mean, let's proceed and keep keep uh, keep in mind that one of these signs is wrong. There is a misprint here. Uh, and then, uh, then yeah, and then the last term, last term is uh, plus a b. Now I'm not sure because the signs may be all a bit off. So in various places, signs may be off. Eh? Square z minus z three. Okay. Uh, Equal to zero. So this is, I mean, this should be just the equation that we st uh, started from the very beginning, 16 point whatever that equation was, 16 point, no, uh, 16 point, uh, where is it? 16.1. It, it should be from 16.1 by specializing, okay, by choosing just z1 equal to zero and by specializing to uh, some particular I mean, parameterizing alpha, alpha prime, etc., in a particular way, hmm? you should be able to get this. So, with the correct sign. Okay. So, please, I'll just leave this as a. I mean, please try, try to do it. One minus c plus a plus b. One minus c plus plus, plus a plus a plus b. Probably it must be that. Huh? Yeah. So, so then this then this will satisfy that equation. But then also please check also this term. Huh? This term also you check. You should be able to get both these things by choosing. In 16.1, you had this alpha, alpha prime, beta, beta prime, and gamma, gamma prime. Okay, uh, and you should be able to. Uh, I think it's the same thing because um, it is the same. Uh, okay, I, I can tell you what one should do actually. Mm, it's the same thing because finally it is simply F A B C. So it should be. It should be in the same same symbol here. Just uh, the, take this P symbol. You have. Uh, Z1 I put to 0, but I keep Z2 and Z3. So, you know, Z2 and Z3, I don't put that to 1 and infinity. Okay, keep as it is. And then the, here it was the same 0, 1 minus, one minus, one minus C, and then A, B, and uh, 0, C minus A minus B. It, it should be the same thing. Okay, and uh, so just keep the Z2 and Z3. Because you see, in order to get from here the hypergeometric equation, uh, what we did was we set one of them to infinity, and as a result, a lot of terms disappeared, right? And that's why the equation, final equation, became simple. But don't don't take it infinity. So you keep all the terms which are there, and you should get this equation. Okay. All right. So, so now, so what is the idea now? So now that what we want is that we want to sort of bring Z two and Z three together, right? But in some particular way. Uh, because I mean, if I just naively put z2 equal to z3, you see this drops out, right? So there'll be no constant term. I mean, no uh, sort of uh, what do you call without derivative term. Hmm? Uh, then this becomes a rather simple type of thing because uh, it's an equation, a first-order differential equation for du by dz. You know, and then you can solve. It's not a. It's a. It's a it becomes a trivial thing, right? So you want to take. You want to bring it together in such a way that you don't. You should get something out of this. You should not. Uh, you should not vanish. Yeah? So one way to do this is to let's say we'll take both of them to infinity. Okay, but uh, let's say I take z, uh, z two equal to two z three, but and then take both of them to infinity. Okay. Again, if I just do this, I mean, it need not be two. It could be anything in particular, right? I mean, but but by doing so, this is never going to be zero. And then, if you take z two, uh, z two, and z three both both to infinity, uh, what's going to happen? 
uh, the numerator there are two powers of z3 uh, right? suppose i write z2 equal to 2z3 right so this becomes 2z3 this becomes z3 so 2z3 square but denominator has three powers z3 so again it becomes very trivial then right um, so i should do something else i should also do something more let's take b and say b also goes to infinity after all these are all parameters in the theory so i will take uh, b equal to z2 equal to 2z3 and all of them to infinity okay so now now this term is there i mean you cannot this, this term is there okay uh, but as a, at the same time what we have done see both these points have have been pushed to infinity so two singularities have coalesced at infinity hmm? so this is the, that's the, the resulting equation is the confluent hypergeometric equation so, so let's uh, do this. Uh, so, when I take uh, this limit, so for what happens to this object? So, this guy becomes okay. C over Z is as it is. Uh, here, uh, Z two is infinite. Uh, Z two and Z two and B are to equal, right? And they are both going to infinity. So, this simply becomes plus one, right? Okay. B B and Z two, whereas this one becomes. Uh, let's see. Uh, b is uh, b is equal to two z three, and that's going to infinity. So this gives you minus two, minus two, because there's a minus sign here. Yeah? So altogether, this becomes minus one, or c minus z divided by z huh? uh, times du by dz. I mean, this remains the same. D two u by dz two plus that, and here. Uh, so if I take so z2 is 2z3, so this becomes 4z3 uh, square, and then so minus 4z3 uh, cube down times z. Hmm? That is what the denominator happens becomes, and the top becomes 2z3, uh, 2z3, two, two 4z3 two square, and then this is z3. So 4z3a times 4z3 cube. So this becomes simply minus a by 2. Uh, minus a by z. Uh, no, sorry, this is 2. What is this? No, this is z. This is z. So minus a by z. This is z. Okay. So you get here minus a by z the u. Okay. Is that? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So you just multiply by z to write to get this equation. So you just multiply everything by z. So you get this equation minus a u. This is the confluent hypergeometric question. Okay. So idea was to take to basically the idea was to bring the two two singularities together, but in in a way that you uh, keeps the non-trivial features of the equation. I mean, uh, not doesn't become a trivial equation. Hmm? That's the idea. So now this equation has only uh, two parameters a and c. That's it. Because one of the singularity I've already set yeah, at zero, z1 yeah, I already taken to zero, and other singularities at infinity. Okay. And once again, if you look at uh, the indicial equations around z equal to zero, in fact, let us see what kind of equation is this. There are only two singularities at z equal to zero and z equal to infinity. Hmm? At z equal to zero, uh, this uh, singularity is of the uh, uh, regular type because we, when you divide by z here, this is only first order pole. And this is also for only first order pole. I mean, in principle, you could have also had the second order pole. That would still be regular. But here it's only first order pole, so it's even better. Hmm? Uh, but at z equal to infinity, if I want to study this, uh, so, so let's see at z equal to infinity what happens. So I write z equal to 1 over z prime as usual and study at z prime equal to 0, right? Uh, so this becomes uh, uh, d2, or d2u over, so again, d by dz is the same as. Uh, minus uh, z prime is 1 over z, so minus 1 over z square, which is same z prime square, d by dz prime. So this that becomes z prime square, d by dz prime, z prime square, d by dz prime. And then that is 1 over z prime. And then here you get c z prime minus 1 divided by z prime, when I write and then du by dz, so it's again another minus. 
uh, z prime square d by dz prime. Yeah. And then finally, minus au. Is it? D by dz. Uh, d, so d by, let's see, d, uh, maybe I made a mistake. D by dz is dz prime over dz, d by dz prime. But z prime is 1 over z. So that gives you minus 1 over z square, right? But then it becomes minus z prime square. Yeah, z prime. So, so this gives you, uh, so one term will be z prime cube because there is a 1 over z prime here. Uh, d2 u by dz prime square. Then the another term and derivative hits here, so a factor of 2. So this becomes plus 2 z prime square because it's a cube and one power down. So du by dz prime. Uh, so actually, hmm. so this just adds up, right? So I can put together, together everything. So this is, uh, this goes out here. So there's a cz prime square. So I can put together everything here. So 2 minus c, huh? 2 minus c z prime square and uh, minus, uh, yeah, minus minus plus. So plus z prime du by dz prime and then finally minus au. That's equal to 0. But now you can immediately see when I divide by z prime, I mean you want to make this coefficient 1, this has a third order pole, right? Already. This is th so it's not a regular singular point. And uh, this guy uh, also has a second order pole, you see, because z prime divided by z prime cube will be 1 over z prime square. So this has a second order pole, and that is a three third order pole. So it's not a regular singular point. So at infinity, it's irregular. Hmm? Okay. But at, at z equal to 0, everything is perfectly fine. It's a regular singular point, so we can make an expansion around z equal to 0 and get the two solutions to the fundamental solutions. So we need to look at uh, the indicial equation. Um, so that is obtained by simply taking the, making a, a s expansion, right? So sorry, is there any question here? I, because I'll now erase some parts. I mean, this, now I'll focus on just this equation. Okay. So, So what is the indicial equation? It was, uh, what is it, r square, uh, what was it, minus 1 minus a naught? Plus or minus here? Minus. Uh, plus? A0 minus 1 times r plus b. Huh? Okay. Uh, b0, b0. Okay. Now a0 was the coefficient of the first order pole of the p, of this function p. Uh, I have to divide by z. And uh, then uh, the, this was B0 was a second order pole. So B0 is 0 anyway for this case because this is, this is only first order pole. There is no second order pole. Hmm? So B0 is 0 for us. And A0 uh, is simply C, right? Because C, when you divide C over z, that is the pole. So this is C. So equation is simply that. So the two solutions are equal to 0 and r equal to uh, 1 minus c, which is indeed, uh, th th this was the case, right? Because whatever else we did, I mean, this didn't change. This, way, this one we didn't change. We just moved z2 and z3 together, both to infinity, but also at the same time b to infinity. You know, we did all that. But this, that didn't touch this part. That didn't change. So that part is remained the same. So we have two solutions, one uh, which is analytic and other which is, uh, if c is not in a, uh, I mean, if this is not an integer, that would be, I mean, if this is not a, if this is not a, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, um, if c is not a negative integer, if c is not a negative integer, then uh, if c is not equal to 0, minus 1, minus 2, etc., because then, then you see this root will have, uh, the real part of this root will be greater than that. So this would be R1, and that would be R2, okay? And furthermore, the difference would be integer in this case, right? For the, if, if, if C was one of these numbers. In that case, you know that the, while for R1, there is an analytic solution, but for R2, there is no, right? In general, not. There will be logarithm and so on, okay? 
so if C is not one of these, then for sure there is a solution corresponding to that, analytic solution corresponding to this. So there is an analytic solution. corresponding to that and uh, it should be uh, again related to hypergeometric function after all because this equation we obtain by some limiting procedure of the hypergeometric I mean you expect that it should be given by the appropriate limiting procedure for the hypergeometric right. Uh, so how do we, we show this? Um, so actually okay, you can of course you can write down the power series here I mean you, you know you can just develop the power series for r equal to 0 and obtain the coefficients the cn coefficient cn and read off from there but uh, the procedure adopted here is slightly different so let me follow this procedure okay so the idea here is to uh, to write down an integral representation for this equation just like we did for the hypergeometric right we wrote it as an integral over some function of t uh, so the same thing we'll do, but uh, we we will use another. Um, so we will consider because remember for hypergeometric what we did, uh, we had uh, some function let's say v of t uh, times uh, z minus t to some lambda. We started from this dt, right? And then we just apply the two de uh, the, this differential operator that hypergeometric differential operator on that, and then we try to you know find what kind of a v I should choose such that. Uh, that this result becomes 0, the adjoint operator becomes uh, 0. Uh, here instead of, this is by the way is called a kernel, this is by the way called Euler kernel. So you, 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 this is a kind of kernel that you use and then multiply it by some function of t and then try to see if you can find some function of t such that the differential equation is satisfied. This is the kind of method you do. Here we will use different thing which is called Laplace, Laplace kernel which will be instead of that this function it will be e to the z t. So yeah. Sorry? Kernel. No, kernel has uh, yeah has some meaning, but what is the meaning kernel? Kernel. I frankly don't know precisely what the meaning of kernel is. It's used in I mean in mathematics it's used in many different uh, uh, contexts. I mean kernel is used uh, uh, in uh, when you have some, uh, I mean, let's say there is some map. There is something uh, where e, something is mapped. Some, some there is some map. Let's say I don't know, some map A from one space to another space or one variable to another variable. Then, uh, in general, I mean, uh, this map would mean that there is a uh, every point here will be mapped to some point here, right? But uh, it need not be one-to-one -one map, right? So it could, could be that several points or even some subspace is mapped to just one point here. It could happen, right? So in particular, suppose if this was a vector space on this side, both say both are vector spaces, huh? then in the vector space, you know, there is one preferred element, I mean one, uh, one distinguished element, which is the zero, right? Zero is a distinguished element of the uh, vector space, right? So if this, so the, the image of the map of this map which uh, image of the zero which means all those points which are mapped to zero okay that will be a subspace if the if the map is a linear map let's say this is, if it's a linear map then this will be a subspace of the original space that subspace is called the kernel kernel of a okay that is the usually uh, the way the way the kernel is used in mathematics huh? now i don't know why this is called kernel i, I don't know maybe the, to say that uh, by starting from this you can obtain some f solution to the, where the, this differential operator, a joint operator, uh, annihilates it. I don't, I don't know what was the origin of this word kernel here, but standard use of kernel is in this sense. Eh? So this would be the kernel of, of the operator A, kernel of A. Okay. Uh, so so we, we start from the Laplace kernel. Eh? So this time uh, we'll start, and we will see, see later why Laplace kernel, eh? because we'll compare it with the hypergeometric. Uh, so, so here we'll start with e to the z t. Okay, again some some contour which has to be determined later. Hmm. So suppose u was of this form. So then let's plug this in here. Uh, 
so you will get uh, this time it's very simple because every time the derivative hits derivative hits only the exponential so it just brings down t yeah? so that's much easier so you get here uh, z t square right when you this, this first term then the second term gives you c minus z t du by dz minus a that's what that's what it is right times uh, times e to the z t uh, times v t So this, this differential operator when acts on the, so this left hand side of this equation, the LHS of this equation is equal to that. Huh? Is that clear? I mean, I just apply two, each time you take a apply derivative, this just brings down a t, the power of t. So I apply two derivatives, it brings down two powers of t, t square. So it, this becomes z times t square plus c minus z times t plus uh, minus a, minus a. So that's the, uh, and now I can, um, uh, let's see, uh, in fact, this is, is that correct, z t square? So actually this becomes a very simple equation, right? Because uh, there is only one, so I can rewrite this as z uh, uh, times t square minus t. I mean, just combine the z terms of that. And then you have plus c t minus a e to the z t, I mean, so this is what it is. But wherever I see z, I can just uh, replace it by d by dt, after all, right? So this becomes t square minus t, so I keep v t here, t square minus t, d by dt. Okay, I'm using the partial derivative just, uh, I mean, just because it's not acting on z, I mean, but it's really ordinary derivative, nothing. Huh? plus uh, c t minus a uh, acting on e to the z t, right, d t. So this is that. And now what I want to do, I want to choose a v such that the adjoint operator acting on the v uh, gives you zero, right. Um, and of course I have to worry about the boundary terms. But uh, let's, so this, since this is the first order, I can keep track of both the terms. Uh, remember for, for the hypergeometric, I didn't keep track of the boundary terms. And I ask you to check the boundary. I just wrote the, use the formula finally there. But uh, this, this one is, uh, so uh, what is a joint operator? So it's simply, uh, uh, okay, minus d by dt, t square minus t, bt, right? That's the first term. Then I just do a uh, integration by parts, there's one term. And the other term, okay, as it is. So plus uh, ct minus a times bt. This must be zero. A statement, uh, and the boundary term is uh, is just that t square minus t times v t, and the boundary term is uh, simply v t times t square minus t times e to the z t. Yes. Uh, so okay, what is this? Uh, this again, I do the same. Uh, maybe I should keep this equation somewhere so that we don't z t two u by d z two plus c minus z d u by d z minus a u okay. equal to zero. A solution of that equation is simple. Uh, just uh, call this guy some g t. Right? Then the equation is simply d g by dt equal to uh, c t minus a uh, divided by t times t minus 1 because t square minus t is a t times t minus 1 g t. Right? If I call this whole thing as g, then v becomes g divided by that. So I just replace v divided by that. And minus sign, so I took it on the other side. Uh, so, so I divide by g here. And this again do the same partial fractions. Hmm? So what is that? This is, uh, let's say I write a by t plus b by t minus 1, which is, uh, so this is the same as a plus b t minus a divided by t minus 1. So therefore, capital A is the same as small a, right? So capital A is equal to small a. And uh, capital A plus B is equal to C, but uh, capital A is small a, so B 
is equal to c minus a. Hmm? So you get that. And then the solution of this equation is g of t, I mean log of g is equal to log of a times log of t plus b times log of t minus 1. So then take the exponential on both sides. So you get g of t is equal to uh, t to the power of a, which is small a, and uh, uh, t minus 1 to the power of capital B, which is c minus a. That is g, and therefore v is uh, simply g divided by t times t minus 1. So v, therefore, we conclude that v dt is t to the power of a minus 1 and t minus 1 to the power of c minus a minus 1. That's the, that's the term. And then for the boundary term, from here you see vt is that, and this is t times t minus 1. So this boundary term is simply t to the a and t minus 1 to the power of, I mean, this is, uh, this is gt. The, the boundary term is simply gt times e to the t. So gt was that, a and c minus a e to the zt. This is the boundary term. this boundary term. Uh, so you can choose the with different contours. I mean, for example, uh, if for different ranges of these parameters. For example, if, if real part of C is, a real part of C minus A is positive, uh, and real part of A is positive, then clearly this vanishes at both t equal to 0 and t equal to 1. Right? So I can ch choose this boundary to be, this contour to be from 0 to 1 in that range when uh, for the real, when, when this is real part of this is positive and real part of this is positive. Uh, okay, so that's uh, one choice. So let's uh, choose this choice. So, okay, so we choose uh, real part of uh, C is greater than real part of A. If you want to make this real part positive, that's that. Huh? And also we want to make the real part of this positive. So this is zero. Real part of C is greater than real part of A is greater than zero. In that case, I can choose this, con uh, the u of z is simply 0 to 1 dt, and then we have t to the a and t minus 1 to the c minus a. Actually, let me write it as 1 minus t to the c minus a. That doesn't matter, up to overall. I mean, you can multiply by any overall factor, right? Some k times uh, e to the z t. Okay? So that's the, that's the solution. That is a one solution. I mean, there, there should be two solutions here, but this is one solution. Now, uh, let us expand. Let's. Sorry. Ah, sorry. A minus one. Correct. Correct. This is c minus one. That's uh, yeah. This v is that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So this is the uh, solution. And now uh, let us. Uh, uh, we can expand it, right? I mean, near z equal to zero, right? I mean, this this function is analytic near z equal to zero. You can see because, uh, I mean, you can this is a power series expansion z, okay? Uh, near z equal to zero, right? So I mean, this is simply one plus z t plus in general uh, z to the n t to the n over factorial n, right? That's what it is. This expansion. So let's see what what kind of a series you get. Um, you get here, but now, so this is t to the n, that makes it, so the coefficient of z to the n, there's a k, this k which will determine, so what we'll determine, we'll fix the k in such a way that at z equal to zero, this becomes one, just like the hypergeometric function, we normalize it so that it was equal to one at z equal to zero. Same way we'll do that here, so this k will, we'll choose to do that. k times z to the n, this n, z to the n, and then I have this integral, 0 to 1, uh, t to the power of um, uh, n plus a minus 1, right? And then 1 minus t to the power of c minus a minus 1, uh, divided by, so 1 over factorial n is here, uh, dt. But this is the beta function, which we have seen, right? This integral. So this gives you, this gives you uh, uh, gamma of, uh, n plus a, and this gives you gamma of uh, c minus a, 
okay, and then divided by gamma of the sum of the two, which is gamma of n plus c, okay, and factorial n of course is gamma of n plus one, okay, uh, so k times z to the n. This is exp this is the result. So this function is indeed analytic. I mean, sorry, this you cannot see. Ah, you can also also not see. Okay, down. Okay. So that's uh, uh, that's the expansion. And now I can choose k to make sure make that z equal to zero. We want it to be one. So I can just choose k to be. So choose k to be uh, just put n equal to zero. So one over gamma a, uh, gamma c minus a, and um, n equal to zero. So this is gamma of c. So choose k equal to that. Okay. Then this becomes normalized to one at z equal to zero. So finally, uh, so we will give it a name to such a, this function. Uh, so the, going back to this original equation, what we are saying, this uh, we are saying that of course this has a one solution, because the uh, this was the at z equal to zero the roots of the indicial equation equations are zero and one minus c, right? So the one which corresponds to zero. That's going to be analytic, provided c is not a, one of the zero or negative integers. Hmm. Uh, so this is uh, that analytic solution. I will just denote by phi, capital phi, and that will depend on what parameters. There are only two parameters here, a and c. So I put here a, c, z. Huh? So this is the analytic solution. The analytic solution near z equal to zero, at, at z equal to zero. And we again normalize it so that phi a c one uh, zero equal to one. Okay. With that normalization, we say that this is in the same as that series. Okay. Um, so this series is uh, so in that case we are saying that phi a c z is uh, once you choose kappa equal to that, then gamma c minus a cancels. And you're just left with gamma c divided by gamma a and gamma a plus n, gamma c plus n, gamma n plus 1 is equal to the n. So this is that. This is what is called the confluent hypergeometric function. This is the confluent. This symbol. Okay. You can and now comparing this with the with the hypergeometric series. You can see, uh, you can you can realize that in fact this is or this can be obtained directly from the hypergeometric function by choosing it, by taking a suitable limit, uh, and that limit I will now indicate. So remember what was the uh, so we had f a b c uh, z was uh, gamma c divided by gamma a gamma b sum n equal to 0 to infinity and this was gamma a plus n gamma b plus n over gamma c plus n gamma 1 plus n z to the n okay now uh, let's take uh, instead of z let's take z by b z divided by b huh? so I, I mean i'm describing the limiting the limit that you have to take so that this becomes that huh? So you take z divided by b. So of course this becomes z to the n divided by b to the n, right? Because I'm, I'm replacing z by z by b, uh, and then take also b to infinity limit. Okay, 
So if we look at this B2, I mean this is gamma B plus N divided by gamma B. What is that? Gamma B plus N divided by gamma B. This is nothing else. B plus N minus 1, uh, B plus N minus 2, all the way up to B, right? How many factor, how many terms are there? There are N terms here, right? So I can take out B to the N outside. Then this becomes, so this is the same as 1 plus n minus 1 divided by b, 1 plus n minus 2 divided by b, all the way up to uh, 1 plus 1 over b times 1, times b to the n, right? That b to the n will cancel with this b to the n, okay? And now I take b to infinity limit, then this just simply becomes 1. For any finite n, it becomes 1. So, and then you see that this just collapses to that because you have a gamma C, gamma A, gamma A plus N over gamma C plus N, uh, gamma N plus 1, and this B to the N just cancelled with all that. Hmm? So, so really this is nothing else but the limit B going to infinity of this hypergeometric function, F A B C uh, Z over Z divided by B. So this is the... It's a certain limit of hypergeometric function. But in a particular way, you are taking the limit, no? Because you are, not only you are taking the, you first you take Z divided by B, so, and then B to infinity. No? So it's in a very, very specific limit. And this will also explain to you why, why we are choosing Laplace kernel instead of Euler kernel here. The, the reason is, uh, in the Euler kernel it was, uh, Z minus T to the power of, uh, uh, what was it, lambda. Lambda was A or B. So remember, the, I could have chosen also B. It, does, it doesn't matter, right? Because it's symmetric in AB. FABC, -A AB was symmetric, right? So I could have also, uh, instead of, I mean, this is the same as exchanging A, B, B, A. It's no problem. So here it was, in fact, remember when we, when we wrote it as lambda here, um, and demanded that the z square term cancels. Lambda had two possibilities. I could, I could, it could be either minus a or minus b, right? I, we chose minus a, but equally well you could have chosen minus b. Answer would be the same. So let me choose minus b here. Uh, and then uh, here, what was the other terms? Uh, what was the uh, t? What was the solution? I always forget this. T to the power of t to the power of a minus one. Uh, so t to the a minus one. Ah, so t minus 1, 2, c minus, c minus, a, uh -huh. a minus, minus 1, yeah. So that's that, yeah. This was the, this was, I mean, uh, after exchanging a and b, is that what you get? B before it was b, right? Before we chose this to be a, or did we choose b? I don't remember what we chose. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, indeed, if you exchange A and B, it should be this. Huh? Uz equal to B, let me see. Uh, yeah, you know, I suppose, huh? B is zero. B is zero. No, I, we are going to take b to infinity limit, right? Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. So I think, okay, this seems to be, uh, if I'm not, uh, uh, minus b. Yeah, is it, uh, t to the a minus 1, what, uh, 1 minus t or t minus 1. So let's take, uh, I mean, there was a, this expression which was, uh, yeah, sorry, and this was, uh, we had obtained this expression which was, um, yeah, 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 here it is 17.31, right? 17.31, it was originally, uh, it was written 1 minus zt uh, to the power of uh, minus a, 1 minus zt to the minus a, uh, t to the b minus 1, and 1 minus t to the c minus b minus 1, correct. So this was the integral, 
together with uh, gamma c over gamma b times gamma c minus b. Okay, this was the F A B C Z. Okay, so in order to do this, uh, I had to remember I made a change of variable also there. I mean, um, uh, I mean initially we had the integral from uh, from one to infinity, then I made t goes to one over t to make it zero to one. So this integral is zero to one. Okay. That is seventeen point three one. Okay. So is this one? But now we know that a is a symmetric in a b exchange. Right, so this is the same as I could just replace b by a. Here, this becomes a, and that is b. So that's f a b c z. Okay, uh, so this is t minus one, or I can now write it as zero one minus t, one minus t, one minus t. Okay, so this is the expression. Uh, uh, so now let's see now how why we get something like this, and unfortunately I erased, I erased that. But okay, uh, so first of all remember I have to take z to z by b, so I should just replace z divided by b, so this becomes z divided by b, okay, and now I take b to infinity limit, okay, but then this becomes simply e to the z t. So that's why this is this that, and in fact, if you I mean I just erase this, but the VT we've obtained the solution for VT was exactly exactly that. Hmm? So so this is the way you can get, and and this kappa, the kappa is of course that you see that was a constant which you had to multiply so that the, uh, the so that it's normalized that at z equal to zero it should be one. Let's see. Uh, now, what about the second solution? Uh, the second solution again you can obtain. Okay. So, I mean, this was the analytic solution, right? But then there should be some solution which goes like z to the power of 1 minus c. Huh? Uh, this you can um, again uh, either by uh, either you start from the second solution of the uh, of the in the Haber geometric and again go through the same limit, right? Or you can just uh, directly uh, work here. I'm um, oh, sorry, just one little comment. Although you see this series we obtained uh, starting from that integral representation. And for that integral representation, we needed uh, this condition real C is greater than real A greater than zero. But really this I could have also obtained directly from the series solution that we already we know how to do series solution, right? You start from the z to the power of r, so I choose z to r equal to zero, and then you just get recursion relations for the coefficients c n, and you will find again the same answer. Okay, but by in in that way of doing, I'm not assuming anything. I'm not taking this condition real c is greater than real a is greater than zero. The only thing you have to say is that c should not be zero or negative integer, otherwise this will become this will blow up. Hmm? So so actually, even though this is derived from this representation. But that was just a limitation of this representation that we had to choose this condition. But it was not necessary to choose this condition. You got to directly work from there and obtain this. Okay. okay. The second solution I can again obtain from uh, maybe the standard. We can probably let's let's try the same way that we obtained hypergeometric uh, thing. So let's now look for a solution uh, which uh, you which is z to the power of 1 minus c uh, times some v, where v is an analytic function. Huh? Because second root is 1 minus c, right? So there should be a solution like z to the 1 minus c times some analytic function of z. And let's plug that in here. Uh, so you get, uh, so, so, so du by this, uh, this you have to keep doing it, is the same as uh, z to the 1 minus c dv by dz plus 1 minus c over z. Then d2 u by dz2 will be uh, z to the 1 minus c d2 v by dz2 plus uh, 1 minus uh, minus 1 minus c over z square. That's from there. Uh, then a derivative acting here will give you uh, again. I take out this here. So 1 minus c over z uh, times uh, times this whole thing.
Yeah, I mean two derivatives that is okay. So plugging everything there. So plugging everything there. Did I have I have I done correctly? D by dz. So this is two derivatives here, and then sec other acting here. So one minus z over z times that, and then I can take out z to the one minus c, which is a common factor everywhere. So you get an equation d two v by dz two times uh, this whole thing multiplied in z. Okay, uh, then let's collect all the dv by dz terms. So dv by dz. Okay, uh, so there is uh, this thing multiplying z, so that gives you one minus c. From here, huh? and uh, yeah, and then uh, from there you get plus c minus z, plus c minus z times this plus c minus z. Hmm? Is that is that correct? Or am I making some mistake here? I, I'm just collecting dv by dz term. So there's one term which comes from the second derivative, but there I have to multiply by z, so that becomes one minus c, and the second term comes from the already the first derivative, there, but that I have to multiply by c minus z, so that's plus c minus z. I mean z to the one minus c I've taken out from everything, I've thrown out that. So that's that. So dv by dz, this, and then the uh, non-derivative term. There are several pieces. Uh, one piece is from here. And that I mean I'm, looks like one minus maybe this doesn't work one minus c z square uh, from here. But then I have to multiply by z, so that is one minus c square over z. And then from here you get minus uh, one minus c over uh, z again. Okay. And that's from these two terms. From this term, I'll get so uh, plus one minus c times uh, c minus z divided by z. Huh? Um, that is what divided by z. This whole thing is multiplying. This is all ah, minus a. Minus a multiplying v. Minus a because just that term, the last term. Okay. Now uh, let's see if uh, uh, the, f the, I mean, this is again of the same form as before, right? Uh, after all, there is a z. There is a linear function of z here, du by dz. Uh, but here, there is a pole, right? Uh, let's see if pole cancels. So if I combine these two things, it's uh, 1 minus c is a common factor. So 1 minus c divided by z. And then you get a 1 minus c minus 1, which makes it minus c, right? And here also, it's plus c times 1 minus c divided by z, so that cancels. And what is left over is this term, but there there's no pole, it's just z. So it's just uh, 1 minus c, okay? Uh, minus 1 minus c, so c minus 1. Huh? So, so this last term is simply plus c minus uh, a minus 1. If I want to write it like the same way, so minus a uh, uh, plus, plus 1 minus c huh? times v. And the CC cancels. So basically, what we are seeing is the the V, uh, the second solution is simply uh, so. So V therefore is is analytic. We know V is analytic, and uh, so by just reading off, you see what it is. This is phi of uh, uh, let's see a a is replaced by this, so a plus one minus c, and uh, c is replaced by one, right? One. Uh, Z. Okay. Now I don't know if I made. This. If there's a mistake, we'll see. This uh, answer is wrong. Confluent. No, it's two minus C. I made a mistake in this somewhere. This is two. This should be two minus C. So let's see, a plus, where is it? Um, so 
So, this part, this one is correct a minus c plus 1, but here it should be 2 minus c. What is happening? This should be 2 minus c and we are seeing only is 1. Oh. This should be replaced by 2 minus c. I mean this is what you obtain from the taking the second solution. The second solution is z to the power of 1 minus c, the hypergeometric. You get f uh, b minus c plus 1, a minus c plus 1 and 2 minus c z, right. If you take the same limit z goes to z by b and then take the limit b goes to infinity, uh, you get this expression but with 2 minus c. I mean z to the 1 minus c is outside, okay, that one. I mean this is v, but this should be 2 minus c. So I think I have ma made some mistake in this derivatives. Do you see if I miss something here in these expressions? z square I don't understand this should be this is simply that uh, 1 minus 0 z square oh unless uh, unless it's adding I mean uh, did I no not there sorry here I mean, say. Eh, sorry is it, uh, I mean, where? Here. Here is two, 2 times 1 minus c. Where do you see that twice 1 minus c? Here there is a factor of 2. Huh? Uh, let's see, we are looking at the dv by dz coefficient, right? So there is a 1 minus c. And uh, I mean, somehow this must, uh, as a sign, I think there's something wrong with the sign. Minus c. That is plus c minus z, is it? V. Sorry, I mean, I cannot. What did he say? What did he say? Is it? Is it two? Is it two? Here. Huh? Sorry, I, I'm not. If it is two, but is it two? I mean, if it is two, then this should be true. <laughs> but yeah, maybe it is a factor of two because I, I'm in fact surprised. Why isn't there a factor of two? Because when I take two derivatives, you can think of that. The, either both derivatives acting here, right, and that gives you one minus c. So that will give you. Uh, 1 minus c times minus c, right? And that is what is coming out uh, divided by z square. That is why he's giving you 1 minus c times minus c times the v. So that is that is part of that. But then uh, two derivatives acting here, that is just that. But then there should be a term where one derivative acts here and one derivative acts here. But there's a factor of two, right? Now why am I missing this factor of two here? That's my question. There should be a factor of two. First derivative is this. Is that that is correct? Minus c. But now the second derivative. <coughs> what is going wrong? I don't. There should be a factor of two here. You see, I mean in this term. Uh, but uh, why am I missing this here? Do you see any? Anyone sees what is the problem? So what do I do? I am taking a deri uh, extra derivative. This is the first. Do we agree with that, the first derivative? Now I apply one more derivative. There are two possibilities. One, when it acts here, you get this. Hmm? Ah, of course, there is a v here. That is my problem. 
Yeah. <laughs> of course, there's a V there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a V here, uh, and then there is one more term here, which is precisely uh, 1 minus C over Z dV by dz. Correct. And also there's a V here. That is a mistake, yeah. Uh, so, so then, yeah, then everything is fine. 2 times 1 minus C, and, um, uh, and so this is 2 minus C. Minus so this is 2 minus C. Okay. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you see, uh, in fact, it was completely nonsensical to miss the V there, right? Uh, otherwise, what is without V? You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, now, what else I can say here? To ah, the behavior at infinity. Good, good. That is a, that's the next point. I mean, it will be interesting, right? Because um, uh, here is the first time you are coming across a situation where there is an irregular singular point. Okay, so so what happens uh, near uh, near z equal to infinity, uh, and for that, so at the moment let's see the most general solution that we have is this plus so some alpha times this plus beta times second solution, uh, which is z to the one minus c times phi a plus one minus c two minus c z. So this is the most general solution. I mean, these two are linearly independent solutions, and that's the most general. But the question is now, what is the behavior at infinity? Hmm? Okay, should I discuss now? Or? Uh, so, in fact, what you can do is that you, you, you define, let's define another solution, psi, a, b, c, z, uh, psi, sorry, not a, b, psi, a, c, z, okay, which I will define through the same integral, this, inter uh, sorry, I erased that, uh, what was it, uh, t to the a minus 1, uh, t minus 1 to the power of c minus a minus 1, right, c minus a minus 1, e to the z t, okay. But before we see, we took the integral from 0 to 1, right. But now let's take the integral from 1 to infinity, uh, in fact, 0 to infinity, let's take 0, zero to infinity. Let me take this integral from 0 to infinity, okay. Uh, what is the 1 plus t? In fact, no, no, sorry, minus infinity to 0, minus infinity to 0. Hmm? This is the definition um, where which will um, uh, time some constant, okay? again, some kappa tilde, let's say, some constant. Uh, this will be okay. I mean, again, if you look at the boundary term, uh, so the boundary term is uh, t to the a, t minus 1 to the c minus a, e to the z t. We want this to vanish, the two endpoints, right? This will be okay if, uh, uh, the, if you look at the endpoint 0, this is fine if a real a is positive, right? So if real a is positive. And uh, now at infinity, if this would, uh, I mean, the, the dominant term would be this one, right? Exponential term. But it's e to the minus z t. So this will be exponentially suppressed provided real z is positive. So in that case, the boundary terms vanish and then this will be fine. Huh? So for this situation where real a is positive and real z is positive, uh, this integral will be well defined. Hmm? Um, Uh, so this will all also be another solution, right? Because uh, I mean the adjoint operator anyway killed that. The only thing we had to make sure was the boundary terms vanish, and the boundary terms vanish for this. Hmm? Uh, but so it, it has to be a linear combination of these two, right? So th there should be some value of alpha and beta such that uh, this solution is a th this is equal to that, huh? some combination. Uh, yeah. Mm. So how do we determine this uh, uh, thing, right? So let's try to determine it in the following way. Uh, for z equal to 0, uh, so let's see, uh, this is do usually done by looking at the two. Uh, just, uh, uh, this has to be generally true for any z, right? 
So let's take for z close to z as z approaches zero. Look at these two. Uh, I mean, uh, and equate the two. You get you need two equations to determine two constants, alpha and beta, right? So one by looking at say as z goes to zero, and other you can look at as z goes to infinity, right? And then that will that should give the uh, two uh, contributions. So how you do this? So let me just uh, try to. First, write down P A B C, P A C Z. I mean the original P A C Z, which was remember the integral of the same integral, zero to one, t to the a minus one, or one minus t to the c minus a minus one, e to the z t. Right? This is the integral, and I will write this integral at times some fact constant, some constant k, which we knew already what the constant is. Uh, this uh, I can write this integral from minus infinity to one, from zero to one, minus minus infinity to zero. Okay. I mean this is uh, simply. I mean zero to one is same as minus infinity to one minus minus infinity to zero. Right. This integral, and uh, let's uh, change some variable in these two integrals. So in the first integral, I change the variable. T goes to one minus t divided by z, and the second integral I change the variable t going to minus t divided by z. Okay, you want t divided by z because this is e to the z t, right? So you want to get rid of the z from here. That, that's the reason for for doing this. So that's why you change the variable t by z. Then this shift of one is simply to make this zero. Okay, that's the reason. So then this integral. Uh, the, the first integral becomes uh, uh, okay minus infinity to one uh, when t is equal to one when t is equal to one uh, this t is zero so let me write t is equal to one minus t prime over z okay so when t is equal to one t prime is zero and when t is equal to minus infinity uh, t prime is plus infinity right so this becomes zero to infinity then uh, uh, then there is a, uh, I mean, actually it is infinity to zero, but then there is a minus in the measure, in the change of the variable, right? dt is equal to minus t prime over z, minus dt prime over z. So that minus goes out, and there is a one over z coming from this is dt. So there is a dt prime here, okay? and then uh, so here you get uh, one minus t prime over z to the a minus one. And then here you get uh, uh, one minus t, which is uh, t prime over z to the c minus a minus one. And here you just get uh, uh, e to the one e to the z, which comes out of the integral. And then you get e to the minus t prime. Okay, that's the first integral. And the second integral is. Uh, uh, once again, so this is not t equal to without the shift, eh? without the shift. I mean that shift. Remember, it was just to make this equal to zero. That's the reason I did that. So now here uh, already, when t equal to zero, t prime is zero, and when t equal to minus infinity, t prime equal to plus infinity. So this is again zero to infinity. Again, that minus sign is absorbed in the measure, and dt prime over z here. Uh, and then the rest of the stuff is uh, simply uh, t prime over z to the a minus one and one plus t prime uh, over z to the c minus a minus one. Okay, that is the result. Now you can see that um, this integral. Um, I mean, this is exponentially diverging. For the uh, when z goes to plus infinity, I mean real part of z in going to infinity, the exponential diverging, which is the kind of behavior you see. Um, so this means that uh, I mean that's uh, that's what's happening near the regular singular point, irregular singular point. As as z goes to infinity, uh, this is exponential. So you remember to study the behavior at infinity, you should take z equal to one over z prime, right? But then if you do that, this becomes e to the one over z prime. And when you make a expansion, this has arbitrary powers. Okay. And 
So arbitrary power, so Laurent series, uh, so it's an essential singularity here. So this is a very, very singular as that goes to infinity. Hmm? Uh, yeah, that's uh, one thing. Um, so, I mean, first thing, if I, what, you, what you notice here is, um, um, I mean, this exponentially growing, that is not, I mean, that is just a I mean, power law for the Z, nothing, there's no exponential growth. So compared to that, you can ignore this. I mean, the real exponential growth is simply determined by that. And uh, now you can even uh, obtain exactly what it is. I mean, uh, so after having taken that, if I want to look at the leading Z behavior as Z goes to infinity, huh? leading Z behaviors, I can just put Z equal to infinity here in both of these things. And so there will be some overall power of Z which will come here, right? As Z goes to infinity, this term will be, you can ignore compared to that, right? And then this is dt prime, uh, this is one and t prime to some power e to the minus t prime, but that is gamma, gamma function, right? That's related to gamma function. So, in fact, uh, you can get this expression, uh, which is uh, keeping also this constant, this kappa, which was, uh, we had evaluated. This was gamma, uh, I don't know, gamma c over gamma a, gamma c minus a. I mean, this was determined by requiring that at z equal to zero, this is one, right? So, sub, so there is a kappa here. So after doing all that, so again, uh, the logic was you take this uh, kappa is that, uh, you take the exponential thing and see the leading behavior there. So for leading behavior, I can ignore this term compared to one in z goes to infinity limit, okay? There is some overall power of z prime, uh, of z, uh, which is actually we can see is a minus a, a plus one minus c, but that one cancels. So this really, I can take this out. So this becomes simply z to the a minus c times this kappa, okay? And then there is e to the z. Uh, and the second term, as I said, there's no exponential growth. So if I'm just looking at how fast it's exponentially growing, I can ignore the second integral. Everything is determined by that. And uh, then uh, this integral is simply a gamma function, okay? Uh, what was the gamma function? Do you remember what was the gamma function definition? Unfortunately, I don't have those notes here. How do you define gamma function? Gamma of, uh, say, z uh, was uh, t to the z minus 1, e to the minus t, 0 to infinity, right? This was the definition? So then you can see, uh, so if once I ignore that, uh, this becomes uh, simply uh, this becomes uh, I mean that becomes uh, so including also kappa so gamma c divided by gamma a gamma c minus a that's kappa then you have a z to the a minus c e to the z so this is the leading behavior and the coefficient of that is simply uh, t prime to the c minus a minus 1 e to the minus t so this is simply gamma of c minus a, right, from this definition. Just replace z by c minus a, you get that. So actually gamma c minus a cancels, so you just have this coefficient. So what we are seeing is that the phi of a, c, uh, z, as z goes to infinity, a, a real z going to positive infinity, positive infinity, I mean the real z is positive infinity, in that case, it behaves like that. The exponential growth, very, yeah, this, uh, uh, that is a fee. What about the second solution? Uh, second solution was z to the 1 minus c times uh, phi. We just did that after making several mistakes. Mm. Uh, what was that? Yeah, a minus c plus 1, 2 minus c, z. Let us see how this will grow exponentially, uh, the exponential term. Well, I mean, this was for arbitrary a, c, right? So we just, uh, instead of a, just take this. Instead of c, you just take that. So this will behave like, okay, there's a z to the 1 minus c. Uh, and then, uh, well, e to the z, of course. And then z to the power of a minus c. But a now is that, and c is that, right? So I will take the difference between these two. So what do you get? Uh, so C, C cancels when I take the, this minus that. 
uh, 1 cancels with the 2, so minus 1, so a minus 1, right? So z to the a minus 1, okay, times what? Times gamma of gamma of uh, this guy, gamma of this guy divided by gamma of that guy. So it's gamma of uh, 2 minus c, gamma of a minus c plus 1. So notice again that this power of z is the same. You see, this guy was a. This, this first solution went like a minus c, z to the a minus c times c to the z. This one also, when you combine this prefactor with the asymptotic behavior of this phi, which is this. So these two things together gives you again a minus c. Hmm? So both of them go like z to the a minus c times e to the z, but with different coefficients. One of them like that, other one with this coefficient. Okay. And finally, we need also the behavior of psi. Yeah, psi was, uh, the, the definition of psi, I mean the psi was the other integral, right, which we defined psi it was simply uh, uh, minus infinity to 0 of the same integrand t to the a minus 1, 1 minus t or 1 minus t to the c minus a minus 1, t e to the z t dt. And uh, uh, this one, I mean, you can just, uh, uh, so again, change the variable t uh, goes to t equal to z over, uh, t equal to t prime over z or minus t prime over z. Uh, then uh, this becomes uh, 0 to infinity because of the minus sign huh? and then you get dt prime there is a 1 over z from here and here you get uh, uh, z to the a, a minus 1 from there t prime to the a minus 1 there are some overall minus 1 to some power uh, I'm not keeping track of that uh, so this is let's say goes like huh? this goes like uh, and then here you get 1 my plus t prime over z to the c minus a minus 1 and then here you just get e to the minus t prime. Now this one you see has no exponential growth at all. Okay, there is no exponential growth in z. Okay. So this, when we said that this, of course I can express psi, in fact that is the reason for this psi, you see, I mean uh, both this, this solutions, this solution and that solution we determine according to its behavior near z equal to 0, right. One of them was analytic, other was had this uh, branch cut, uh, z to the 1 minus c. But both these solutions exponentially diverge at infinity, okay? So question is, uh, in some physics problem it may appear, it may happen that you are looking for a solution which does not grow at infinity, okay? Which does not grow, whereas both of these solutions grow exponentially at infinity, okay? Now this psi, this particular combination is such that this does not grow exponentially. There is no exponential term here, okay? Uh, so, uh, so this may be interesting if you are looking for some physical solution of this equation which does not, which behaves, uh, uh, I mean which does not diverge at infinity, you know, you may be interested in something like that. In that case, it is this solution. But this solution of course will be a certain linear combination of them. But which linear combination? Well, it's clear uh, that to get this, I better cancel these exponential terms. Both are exponential growth. So they have got to cancel, right, which means uh, that um, this uh, if, if this means that this must be um, this must be uh, let's say uh, some alpha uh, first one the first solution phi a c z uh, plus beta uh, z to the one minus c the second uh, which is um, a minus c plus one two minus c z but I have to choose alpha and beta alpha and beta must be such that these leading terms cancel. So that already tells me the ratio of beta and alpha, right? Beta must be equal to, uh, beta must be equal to uh, minus alpha times gamma C over gamma A and then uh, times gamma of A minus C plus 1 divided by gamma 2 minus C, right? So that the exponential cancels. Uh, now, of course, the precise alpha and beta I can fix by uh, just taking uh, z equal to 0, right? Uh, I mean, I have also freedom to, in fact, the way they have defined psi 
is not just by this, but uh, putting a gamma also. I think there was a there is instance definition. There is a constant here, which that constant has been chosen to be one over gamma a. Okay, with again to, uh, this is to normalize at. Uh, at uh, z equal to 0 because uh, let us see at z equal to 0 this drops out and then this is uh, um, I mean I do not know everyone should check whether this is true or not uh, you know I mean okay, they have defined it like this 1 over gamma a this normalization. Uh, so now let us uh, let us evaluate at z equal to 0 what happens I mean it is not so important but I am uh, just if you want to get precise, I mean here this gives you a ratio between beta and alpha, right? But if you want to really determine what is what are alpha and beta, you need one more equation, and that is uh, obtained by setting at z equal to zero, right? You, see, you can evaluate this at z equal to zero. Here z equal to zero, both phi and this phi and that phi are uh, is one, right? Again, assuming the real part of one minus c is positive, this drops out at z equal to zero, so you just get alpha, right? So left hand side is just alpha. So if you can evaluate this, what happens at z equal to zero, then you are done, right? So to get this expression for z equal to zero, uh, what you do? Z equal to zero, this integral is uh, minus infinity to zero, uh, t to the a minus one times one minus t to the c minus a minus one. Okay, there is just one over gamma a, and um, uh, you can. Uh, do it, I think, in different ways. Um, you see, I mean, the st the, this is the, this should be related to beta function after all, right? Uh, provided I can, for beta function, the integral was zero to one, zero to one, right? So uh, I have to make some change of variable such that, say, one of them goes to one of them stays zero, other guy goes to one, uh, other guy goes to one, right? So I could, um, how shall we do it? Um, if you have suppose 1 over t, 1 over t at infinity will be mapped to, no that is no good. <clears throat> How can I do this? Um, so I want to map, uh, or you can split this integral. You know. uh, first of all change a variable, let us see, make it 0 to infinity and then in split the integral from 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity, right? And then from 1 to infinity you take t to 1 over t, which again maps to 0 to 1. But I think it should be possible to directly do it. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just stop. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, you change some variable uh, to some variable, say t prime, such that when t goes to in minus infinity, t prime goes to say zero or one, and when t, t goes to zero, t prime goes to other one. So instead of these things, you want to take it to zero one, right? Maybe I'll just leave this now. Uh, leave this as an exercise, and to, uh, ne next time we'll do it. Eh? It's a change of variable. I mean, generally, for by SL two C SL two transformations, you know that three points can be removed, make to any another three points. Here, it's even much less requirement. Here, we are saying just take two points and move it to zero and one. So, with the standard procedure, you should be able to get that. And then this will become some beta function, and uh, yeah. All right. So, I think I'll stop now. Uh, this is the basically the discussion of confluent, and now we'll uh, show that all these Hermite polynomials, Laguerre polynomials, are all this are related to confluent. Next time, and we discuss Bessel function. Those are the important things. Yeah.